Control Dance Theater, and Shoebox Studios, San Francisco. Tickets are available now at www.lookingglasstickets.com. You are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Coming up next, Tara Verde. Stay tuned. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host, Adam Greenfield. Good afternoon. With environmental concern fairly high on the public mindset these days, many of us have ticked off the easy action items, you know, recycling, energy-saving light bulbs and so on. But I don't know about you, when I look around on the streets and wherever I go, things don't really look that different. Things kind of still seem pretty much the same. Fossil fuel still pumping out of the ground, uh, we're consuming the same as ever, trash going into landfill, uh, oil spills uh, and whatnot. So, you know, where's the evidence that things are really changing? Uh, one example is air travel. That's responsible for 3.5% of human-caused climate change. And it's also 11% of U.S. transport greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, things aren't really changing there. Well, back in 2005, Bay Area resident, freelance writer and transportation planning advocate Josh Hart decided he'd had enough of tokenistic gestures. So he gave up air travel completely. Now, the next year, Josh actually needed to return to England uh, to complete his master's degree, but he's still stuck at the no air travel uh, experience. To explain how he did that and to share his views on what difference one person can make, Josh joins me in the studio today. Josh Hart, welcome to Terra Verde. Thanks so much, Adam, for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you. And I should say that um, Josh is going to share his story about um, uh, air travel and more. And uh, if you've got any thoughts on that uh, and personal action in general, well, you can call in and uh, chat to us live on the air. The number is 510-848-4425. That's 510-848-4425. So, Josh, in 2006, you went back to England for three years. And you got there and back here to the Bay Area without flying in a plane. How did you do that? Well, you know, I, 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 I've always hated flying. It's always been a really unpleasant experience being stuck in this, in this uh, aluminum tube at 30,000 feet, breathing reprocessed air. And, you know, it's just, it's just basically unpleasant. And I, I just never knew there was an alternative way to get to Europe where uh, my, my, half my family is. And, uh, several years ago, I learned about the possibility of taking a cargo ship, um, across the oceans. And what, what, what the situation is, is basically these cargo ships with containers, uh, run constantly you know, um, uh, amongst the world's oceans, taking all the stuff that we consume every day in big, big containers, for, largely from factories in China, um, to, to bring to us. You know, every, everything, a little thing from a toothbrush to larger consumer appliances. Mm -hmm. And I, I met uh, this guy, um, Ethan, uh, who who went to Europe um, every year and went by cargo ship and he explained that you know um, the, the cargo ships have more rooms more cabins than, than they actually need because a lot of the, the tasks have been mechanized and uh, so I decided that um, in 2006 you know I learned a, a more about the impacts of aviation and you know whereas uh, the, the numbers are that aviation only you know takes uh, consists of about three and a half percent of global emissions the actual impact is about seven percent or eight percent because of the fact that um, airplanes release that carbon at a high altitude. So, um, but the individual impact, the impact on your own carbon footprint is amongst the highest, um, you know, of anything that you can do. Uh, and so I, you know, I learned, for example, that a round trip, one seat on a round trip flight from San Francisco to New York City is the equivalent of leaving your, your refrigerator door open for 20 years. 
20 years. Yeah. Well, I feel guilty living it open for 10 seconds. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's just it's just this monumental waste of energy. You know, it's all this oil that's coming out and we're burning it. Um, you know, a thoughtless trip over to New York for a shopping trip. So I thought, you know, I, I need to get to, to England. I'm going to Bristol to this university to do a transport planning master's degree. Uh, I want to be involved in the campaigns that are running over there against, uh, for example, the third runway at Heathrow Airport. And um, I want to want to explore the alternative. So that's what I did. I, I, I worked out. I researched it. Um, I took an Amtrak train uh, from San Francisco to New York City and then on to Montreal. How long did that take you? That took three days to New York and another day to Montreal. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I think we've sort of forgotten about how wonderful travel itself can be. You know, we, we're so focused on the destination these days that we forget about the actual moving, the actual tra traveling. Mm, and, and trains as well. I love trains. And trains are so wonderful. You know, the, the, the sound of the rails and, um, you know, stopping by all these stations and the scenery across the United States. You know, and Amtrak, you know, it's not perfect. There's a lot of problems with it. But they do have these amazing observation cars. You can go and you can sit and you can go through, you know, um, these, these canyons through the Rocky Mountains and, um, and you meet people. People from all over the country. You know, you go through Utah and Colorado and Nebraska, and people get on from those communities, and you you find out about about where they live. And so the actual experience of traveling becomes you know something to be sought after, not not just some a time to be reduced or minimized. Um, so I met some amazing people on on board the train. I, I met a blues musician from Chicago. I brought my guitar on board, and so we had these jam sessions, you know, in the in the train, and and mm -hmm. the other passengers would gather around, and we would have like, you know, we'd get a couple beers, and we'd hang out, we'd we jam, um, and I learned the the blues chords, you know, he taught me ta Dock of the Bay chords, so like, you know, it, it it almost felt like this traveling community, and. Um, so I got to Montreal and uh, met up with some some other bike advocates who who were there. Rode on the critical mass, and in fact, you know that uh, during that critical mass, the police actually cracked down and started you know beating people, um, just peaceful cyclists riding along. And so I, I then sort of you know realized that this movement that we have um, you know to make our streets sustainable and safe and and greener, this is this is global. This is truly global, and it's happening. And and repression of that movement is happening globally. So I went to Montreal, which was an amazing city. I never would have gone there had it not been you know traveling on the surface and then where uh, and then i i hopped on a a, a container ship um, a german owned uh, container ship and we sailed out the st lawrence seaway um out into the atlantic and you know as uh north america sort of you know disappeared on the horizon i was suddenly out in the middle of the, the ocean something i'd never i'd never been out in the middle of the ocean where you couldn't see land anymore did you book that in advance did you just show up and get yeah, on yeah no you have to you have to totally book in advance it's not just like you know going on expedia.com or whatever uh -huh. um you actually you have to plan it out and you have to send in a doctor's note that you're you know healthy and you're fit to travel oh, really? and you have to be flexible you know within two or two days because um whenever they finish loading the ship mm -hmm. with, a, with a thousand containers that it contained uh you know they go they say you you got to show up at the port and you got to go uh -huh. so um but it was a, it was an incredible experience you know um just being out on the deck it's not like a cruise ship you know you have to sort of make your own entertainment um but it was really nice to have these 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 days at sea you i went out to the the bow of the ship the front and um it was really quiet up there and i played my guitar and read books and did, you know i blogged every day you can blog from the ship. Well, uh, I, I recorded my, I wrote my entries and then okay. uploaded it when I arrived in okay. Europe. But the ship was headed from Montreal to Antwerp, and um, you know, hanging out on the on the deck, you'd see dolphins and whales um, surface and, and flying fish, and a ton of seabirds. And you know, and how long did that take you to get to Antwerp? It was nine days. Nine days. Yeah. Wow. I've I've I did a four day sailing trip in Australia when half of the crew uh, threw up because it was so rough. But I guess that was a smaller boat. Larger boats don't have such Sure. Well, it was it was pretty large, and, and there was one day where it was really really rough, and um, and you know uh, I, I I was sick one day, but um but I seemed you know I got to, got to know the Filipino crew who was um who was working on the ship, and uh, we got some you know made, made some friends with them, and it was just it was just a really you know pleasant experience, and it was you know two weeks from San Francisco to to London, um you know as opposed to eight hours on the plane, but I didn't have to go through Heathrow, which is a nightmare. Uh -huh. I didn't have to sit in this uncomfortable seat. I didn't have to eat terrible food. Um, and it was a real adventure. I mean, it was just something I'll never forget. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's, a, there's an Indian uh, phrase that says, um, if you travel um, any far 
faster than walking, you have to stay in your destination for a certain amount of time to let your soul catch up. Now, you know, I don't believe in a soul, but it's an interesting idea that uh, the faster you travel, the less you kind of are able to get your head around the journey and kind of really take it on board and understand you know, what are the impacts and what is everything related to this journey? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, traveling slowly, um, just to, like slow food, like slow travel is an increasingly popular um, pastime. And, you know, we, we just like slow food allows you to savor the flavors and, and, and get to know your food. Slow travel lets you get to know the earth um, because we tend to fly from one airport to the other and skip everything in between. Fly from one, basically what they, where they are, shopping malls um, at these airports. They actually make more money from retail sales at the, at the airport than they do from the sale of the airplane tickets. Really? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we, as a society, we've sort of gone, you know, dove, dove in, dived in, uh, head first to, um, these technologies and, um, not thought about the consequences. And, you know, there was an Indian saying, a Native American saying, and they were, that, uh, that, you know, there would come a time when, um, people would travel very fast and the seasons would change. And that's exactly what we're seeing now is, uh-huh. is you know, we're, we're traveling faster than ever. We have unprecedented mobility, but, um, we're pumping our atmosphere, you know, Five billion tons of carbon dioxide into a, a, a eggshell thin atmosphere every year, and it's got it's got to stop. It seems like we're trying to compete on Indian sayings here, so I, I'm out. <laughs> so if you've got one more, you win. So okay, let, let's cross off some um, some obvious questions about this journey. First of all, do you know about the uh, carbon emissions impact of of the journey that you did, as opposed to getting a plane? Well, you know, there's different ways of calculating that. Um, with, with a cargo ship, it's very difficult because the reason the cargo ship travels is because, obviously, of the cargo and, and any passengers that they carry are secondary. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cargo ships are, are traveling our, our oceans um, every day, and they use the dirtiest kind of fuel, bunker, bunker oil. Um, you know, which was what the Costco Busan spilled into San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago. Um, and it's disgusting stuff. It really is noxious, um, bad for the air, bad for the, the, the climate. Um, so, so they're not environmentally friendly. There's, I just want to make that clear. And, you know, any long distance travel has major, major co- environmental consequences. So, so the bottom line is that we need to travel. Um, more locally, we need to travel uh, less frequently, and it needs to be something very, very special, not the kind of routine, you know, I'll just pop over to Paris for an espresso and, and, and pop back. That's just no longer acceptable or moral, I think, you know, in the society. Um, as far as the actual carbon footprint, um, you know, there, there, there was some calculation done that a cruise ship, which is the, the motor transport actually took back because there was no cargo ship available mm-hmm. uh, just last year, a, cargo, a, a cruise ship uh, per passenger generates three times the emissions of a uh, of a plane, but of course you know the car, uh, cruise ships are like these floating resorts. So you've got all the cooking, all the electricity, all the hot tubs, and all that you know associated um, energy use. So you know I, I think you know the bottom line is we just need to make long distance travel you know once or twice in a lifetime experience. You know go f- go for a few months, travel the world, see it, and then come back and make your local community really you know special and and sustainable and um, and you know make. That that quality of life, the priority. So carbon emissions is kind of a sketchy issue there, um, as opposed to if you really saved anything or if you emitted more. But what about the personal effects of, of just slowing down, perhaps it being more difficult to travel? I mean, how does it how did it change you personally, that experience? Well, it, it, it certainly acquainted me more with, you know, uh, different kinds of communities. Um, I went through, you know, New York City and Montreal and Antwerp and Belgium and on my way to, to London, it wasn't just like I skipped over these places. And, um, you know, I, I think that if we, if we uh, acquaint ourselves more with, with what's going on, on the planet rather than just getting to the destination, I think that's a, a bonus. And I think that, you know, slow travel necessarily takes a long time and it requires us to take time off. And, you know, in, in England, uh, there's five weeks of paid vacation. That is just standard as opposed to two in the U.S. Um, and I, and I think in general, if we're going to travel slowly using, you know, boats and trains, we need, you know, more time off. We need more flexible time. And I think that's a good thing. I think people are really, you know, a lot of people are really unhappy in their jobs and we need to restructure the way that we do work, what kind of work we do and um, and how content, how much time we have to spend with our families. Mm-hmm. So that this whole concept that you can actually, you know, use travel time as a, as, a, as a productive time. You know, I'm a writer. I did a lot of writing when I was on the ship. I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. It's actually useful time and it wasn't just wasted. And we tend to think, well, we've just got to get there, you know, get where we're going and then the grass 
grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And a lot of the time, you know, on, on the way to where you're going, you actually discover something that's really, really special. So I want to just uh, make it clear to the to the listeners that um, I did something similar to Josh in a way. Um, in 2009, I committed to not ride in a car at all. Not only not to drive, but not to ride in one. And um, it, it was a very interesting experience to me. And, you know, I definitely got a lot of flack for it. Um, uh, even that was a wonderful personal transformation experience to an extent. Uh, but one of the things that people kept raising to me was, it's okay for you to do that because... In my case, I don't have kids. I work, you know, a, a mile or two from where I live. It's okay for you, but I have kids at three different schools. My job is 20 miles away. If I didn't have my car or if I couldn't fly, in, in some people's case, then I, I wouldn't be able to get by. How do you deal with that um, issue of it's okay for you but not for me? Well, you know, we need, you know, the, the, the climate and energy problem and, and clearly the oil spill is, is a huge part of that, an indication that things are going very, very horribly wrong with our energy use. We need to tackle that both on a personal level level and a societal level, a structural level and an individual level, and we, we can't do one without the other. So, you know, to the extent that we can support our governments when they reallocate space from motor vehicles to bicycles, pedestrians, and transit, um, to the extent that we can support better trains, um, and, and in some cases faster and more convenient trains um, and, and buses, you know, th those make that makes the opportunity to, to to leave your car at home or to even get rid of it entirely possible. Um, and you know, I would I would say that the dominant paradigm of you know, oh well, I don't want to sacrifice my car. I don't want to sacrifice my my holidays abroad. I don't want to sacrifice all the great stuff that I buy and all the little gizmos. That and I'm I, entitled to them. I'm entitled it's to my it. right. You know, I, I think that the reality is something very different. And what I've found since you know, I, I gave up my car ten years ago. And um, it's been, you know, about four years since I've quit flying. And what I've noticed is that as I've slowed down, as I've stopped, you know, buying so much stuff and um, really connected with my friend, I've been able to connect with my friends. I've been able to reconnect with my family. I've had, you know, more leisure time because I'm spending less on the on, on fossil fuels. And I'm getting to know my local, you know, local area. I mean, the Bay Area is just so beautiful. It, you know, in the last um, several weeks, just in the spring, I've been, you know, hiking along the ridges. And, and mm. we, we, we tend to, you know, live our lives down in you know in in the traffic and in the the air pollution and and, and there's this ironic situation where human beings have created um, you know habitats for ourselves that are hostile to human beings and that is something that's very very dysfunctional and um, you know we need to re reacquaint with nature I've been getting um, learning more about edible wild plants in the area and um, you know a lot of the plants that we consider weeds that are growing out in our backyard uh, are actually edible and you know there's tons of mustard um, blossoms that are edible and, and and wild radish and obviously you need to get to, you need to get to know what's uh, what's edible before you go out and, and, eat, and eat the weeds but, but I, 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 I'm getting a feel here for that that the, like the, these acts that you did these couple of acts of kind of led to this spiraling of awareness and you're kind of seeing lots of different things i mean you're i can i can feel your your brain like training off into these like other areas that maybe you didn't think about originally yeah, but it's yeah. kind of it's, i mean it's, it's interesting it's, our modern lifestyles it's very easy to insulate ourselves from the real world and from the natural world and and you know if you're in a car i drove a car for a long time I, i've done a lot of flying in my life i'm not perfect you know and and I've, I've had a huge carbon footprint in my life that i'm not happy about but it's time to admit that we have a problem that we're addicted to fossil fuels in a really big way um and we and we need to to to, to understand that that addiction is affecting our quality of life and, the, and that using less fossil fuels will make us uh, happier people and make us more acquainted you know, with, with um, our, the natural world. And okay. when you're in a plane, when you're in a car, when you're rushing around, it's very easy to forget that we're, we're in a natural world and that's having obviously devastating consequences to the environment. Sure. Well, this is Terra, Ver Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on 94.1 KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. Today, freelance writer and transportation planning advocate Josh Hart joins me, Adam Greenfield, to discuss personal action on environmental issues. And if you want to call in, the number is 510-848-4425. Uh, that's 510-848-4425 if you have a question for Josh. So, Josh, um, in 2006, the same year that you had your first full year without flying, Justin Rolat, who worked for the BBC, uh, did a year-long experiment himself called Ethical Man. And for a year, him and his family did everything that they felt a reasonable family could do to cut their carbon emissions. So they um, gave up meat, they didn't fly, they got rid of their car, they, you know, recycled, swapped out energy-saving you know, things. And at the end of it, 
his um, carbon emissions were reviewed by a local university and it was found he had cut 20% of his emissions with everything that he did uh, going way beyond what, uh, you know, any regular person would probably consider reasonable. Um, given that in mind, that that that, okay, so that, that everything that we can do is... Um, you know, only going to lead to something like that. How do you respond to that? I mean, uh, it, it is like these per, are these uh, isolated acts the way to go, or do we need to be thinking about a fundamental restructuring? And and how the hell do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely. The the personal the personal changes uh, are are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, we need to organize. That is critical. We need to organize with, within our communities and um, internationally to, uh, to to change the way that things are. To make food production local. Uh, to you know uh, to relocalize our lives essentially, and and to relocalize our communities. Um, so it's it's you know, I think I, I have some problems with ethical man uh, from the BBC. You know. I, I think that um you know, I think that, that 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 there's sort of a blind spot in modern environmentalism, where, like, for example, this hands across the sand thing. It's very well intentioned. People are gathering on Saturday tomorrow to to hold hands, you know, on beaches. Oh, throughout and spell the world. out the word. Is that spell out the word slash oil? Is it? I think people are doing different things, but they're yeah. having helicopters, you know, photograph them and, and everything. And you know, they they don't even they don't even mention on the website to to you know that you should try and bike or walk or or, or take transit or even carpool. And it's like it's like the the environmental organizations that are that are in existence right now are so reluctant to take on, you know, people's cars um, that we're so we're so we have this blind spot. We're, we're calling for an end to offshore drilling, but you know, in an age where the the oil supply is dwindling, where are we supposed to get the oil to power our cars? We need to really fundamentally reexamine, you know, how we get around. Uh, and, and the single occupant vehicle thing that's not going to work anymore. That doesn't have a future. Yeah, and and the other thing, there is no such thing as a green car. Thank you. I've yes, said this on Adam, previous shows. Absolutely. How can it be green to spend so much energy on pushing one or two people around and the majority of the energy go towards pushing metal around? Yeah, electric cars, uh, solar cars, you know, these things still kill our children. They Total still make junk. it unsafe to walk or bicycle. Yeah. Uh, you know, we cannot offset this problem. We have to make fundamental, major, major changes that are just not being discussed in the mainstream media right now. Okay, well, on the line, we have Zach from Alameda, who's got a question for Josh. Zach, are you there? Yes, I'm here. How are you, Zach? Good. I, I actually sold Josh a recumbent bicycle uh, several years ago before his trip to the UK. Hi, Zach. Do you remember that? I do. <laughs> okay. Well, Zach, um, I, 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 are you going to grill Josh or, or not? <laughs> I, I just want to congratulate him. I think it's really great what he's what he's doing. I actually took the Amtrak train across the U.S. in 2002 to visit New York and uh, Baltimore and Chicago, and um, I... I I'm a strong believer in the damage that planes are doing and try, try to avoid them at all costs. But I, I, I have been, uh, I have gone to Europe several times in the past, so I have a, a big carbon footprint. Uh, but I, next time I go there, I would like to take a, a freighter. I, I wonder if Josh could, uh, uh, give us information on uh, how, how to, uh, arrange that. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult to find. You know, if you do a search on the internet for, you know, the cargo ship across the Atlantic or something, you'll come up with a lot of these companies that are really not very nice to deal with, to be honest. And they're sort of cutthroat and, uh, they, they take a huge profit margin. My, um, recommendation to anyone who wants to travel on the surface, you know, using trains and boats anywhere in the world is to go to seat61.com. That's S-E-A-T 61.com. Oh. And, uh, is this travel agent from London, who is 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 keenly aware of the of the carbon problems with aviation, and has researched timetables, recommendations, cargo companies, uh, and there's various different options that you can you can choose. Um, the, the bottom line on on cargo travel is that it is going to be slightly more expensive than than taking a plane, but it does include ten, you know, whatever how many days of uh, food and, and and lodging. You know, you don't have to you don't have to pay. So mm. and you get to live, and you get to <laughs> breathe the. the you get out there and, and live. You, yeah, you, you don't have to breathe all these toxic air that they reprocess through the airplanes and, and so okay, on. Okay, well, thanks, Zosh, uh, Zach. We also have uh, Osho on the line. Yeah. Oh, did, did I say your name right? Is it Osho or Osho? Mm-hmm, that's right. Okay, uh, what's your question for uh, for Josh? Well, I think he answered it from the previous caller. I was asking him what, what would the cost to be then to travel like from San Francisco, say, to England on a cargo ship. 
Yeah, I mean, you can basically budget about $120 a, a day on a cargo ship, and and across the Atlantic, it takes about nine or ten days. Okay. So you can calculate that. You know, Amtrak isn't too bad a deal um, throughout the the U.S. Uh, and mm-hmm. you know, we're seeing we're seeing a major major uh, increase in ridership uh, on Amtrak, and I think that mm-hmm. that's that's partially because people are fed up with uh, car travel and they're fed up with plane travel, and they want to mm-hmm. sort of enjoy the the journey. And so you can actually save money and enjoy the trip if you um, if you if you go on Amtrak and uh, you know it's something that's highly recommended rather than sitting okay. in the, in these horrible uh, traffic jams on on interstate <laughs> interstate Thank, highways. You know? Right, that Thank. sounds great. I also have one more quick question. Like I I ride a bike and I don't have a car right now because my car died about a year ago. But I've noticed since I've been riding, it's been a great experience. And I was wondering, should should there be some kind of government incentive programs for people who do ride and commute by bikes? There, there should be a lot of changes in our transport policy with regards to non-motorized traffic to, to bicycle, bicy- bicycling and walking, uh, and you know it, it, it's really horrible. I mean, if you look, if, if, if history will judge this time in our in our history, you know, the future will judge us. Uh, people who are trying to use less oil in their lives, who are trying to prevent something like the um, Gulf spill disaster that's happening, are threatened. You know, their safety is threatened um, by unsafe road conditions. And I, I've mm-hmm. been riding for ten years. I'm a, a bicycle safety instructor. I know all the right things. I'm 34 years old. You know, um, mm-hmm. I am still scared. I am scared sometimes um, riding in, in traffic. And if you want to learn more and how to how to uh, improve your own safety riding on the road, I recommend taking a bike education course. Uh, okay. the, the San Francisco Bike Coalition, sfbike.org mm-hmm. forward slash edu, mm-hmm. offers free uh, courses um, to, to people throughout the Bay Area. So, uh, you know, but we need to lobby so much harder for uh, safer cycling conditions. Okay, thanks, Osho, for that. Um, all right, Josh, I want to get, get back to another um, related issue with you. Um, on the matter of personal action, there's a BP Arco uh, protest today, right, at a gas station in San Francisco just off of Divisadero. Um, can you tell me a bit about that and how this relates to the personal action issue? That's right. So as probably many of your listeners will know, uh, BP uh, does sell its gasoline through Arco stations uh, and AMPM uh, mini markets throughout the Bay Area and throughout California. And uh, you know, many people are calling for a boycott of those stations. You know, uh, we've been organizing some protests at the Fell and Divisadero Arco station in San Francisco. Um, this is a real. Uh, this has been a thorn in the side of people who are trying to, to ride their bicycles through San Francisco. It's uh, part of the, the the only level east-west route in San Francisco. And uh, for many, many years, uh, drivers who are lining up for cheap Arco gas have been blocking the bike lane, blocking this only level, this only level route uh, to, to Golden Gate Park. And, um, you know, there's a connection. You know, p- if people who are trying to live less oil-dependent lives, their lives are being threatened. And, uh, you know, the guy who, who, who runs the, um, the bar across the street says he's seen, you know, dozens of cyclists injured at this location. And the owner of the station has been really, really resistant to any changes to improve safety. The city of San Francisco has basically failed for 10 years to make this safe for people. And so we, uh, for the last three weeks, have been going out We've been uh, blocking that entrance, the Fell Street entrance to the Arco station, uh, to, to make it safe for people who want to live less oil-dependent lives. And, and we will continue to be out there every Friday at 5.30 p.m., Fell and Divisadero Arco station. We're going to be out there this evening. Uh, there's a rumor that Critical Mass is going to come by and, uh, and, and you know, to support the effort. But p- come out and join us. Um, we're out there every Friday at 5.30. Okay. And, and this is, you know, we're not going to go away until the city of San Francisco plugs its the driveways and, and, and BP plugs these holes that are continuing to spew into the Gulf. Okay, and that was your plug. So um, we have we have just 30 seconds left. So very very quickly, um, very I want a very quick answer from you. No, not flying was a kind of awakening experience for you in a sense. What can people do to have a similar experience to wake up from this kind of haze that we're in in, in modern modern life? Well, I think you know just get get out on your bicycle. We're you know we're in a situation where in a society, our society encourages us to to lead sedentary lifestyles, and we're meant to get exercise as human beings. So we're not fully living until we get exercise, until we get that blood pumping, and you know get out on your bike, have a physical okay. activity. You know, uh, my blog is on the level blog.com if anyone wants to um, learn more about All right. research but that's it that's it we, we've run out of time thanks, thanks very much to Cheers. Josh Hart for joining me uh, Terra Verde is over join us next week uh, I'm Adam Greenfield we will see you soon thank you join us again over lunch between 1 and 2 in the afternoon on Fridays to hear more about the unfolding future of the planet
KPFA, KPFB en Berkeley, en KFCF en Fresno, en online at kpfa.org.